I'm gonna be honest, I'm a little bit intimidated talking about this one, because I mean, how do you talk about a game as influential and as big as this one was? Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare, not only considered one of the best shooters ever made, but one of the best games ever made. I mean, yeah, no pressure, am I right? In the mid-2000s, the World War II genre was getting pretty tired, and this wasn't really just the public that thought this. It also seems like internal teams at Infinity Ward were probably starting to get a little tired of this as well. Believe it or not, Call of Duty was originally pitched to Activision by Jason West, Vincent Pella, and Grant Collier as a modern game, being more in line with something like Counter-Strike or the Tom Clancy games. But we were at a crossroads at the time, you know, World War II shooters were at the tail end, and modern shooters were at the... Tail beginning? Is that the word I'm looking for? I don't know. And when it came to sci-fi shooters, I mean, Halo basically had a stranglehold on the market at this time. When Activision initially came to Infinity Ward, they weren't really interested in making a modern game. They wanted a slice of that Medal of Honor cake. And, you know, to give them credit, it did work out exceptionally well for them. But you can still kind of get the sense, you know, Infinity Ward really, really wanted to try something new. They didn't want to just be confined to World War II at this time. They wanted to do something new and exciting. Get a setting that would allow them to do a lot more that was limited with World War II. And honestly, in fact, if you want to deep dive into what COD 4's development was like, strongly recommend checking out Racevic's video on the game. He did an excellent discussion about the game's development and some of the behind-the-scenes stuff going on with the devs. Pretty much how I got a lot of my sources for this video, actually. I don't know how much this really applies to the game, but I feel like it's worth bringing up, you know, you kind of have to remember the context for when this game initially came out, too. World War II wasn't really on people's minds at the time anymore, like it was when Spielberg made it mainstream several times over. If people were thinking about anything related to the military at the time, it was probably the war in the Middle East. Now, whether or not the timing of Modern Warfare being greenlit had to do with this at the time, I can't confidently say. Like, look, I was, I was eight at the time, like, and the only games I was probably playing at this point were Sonic and Pokemon, and that was probably the only thing I had any kind of feelings on. Dude, I'll fucking go back in time, talk to my eight-year-old self, and be like, what do you think of the war on terrorism? <laughs> what I can confidently talk about, though, is just how big this game was. I was already vaguely aware of Call of Duty from seeing it in stores, watching family members play the game, etc. But when this game came out, everybody, and I mean everybody, was talking about Call of Duty. You could not escape just, like, how big of a deal this game was back in 2007. Like... For better and also for worse, this is what made Call of Duty the juggernaut it is today. I still remember one of my earliest memories seeing this game in action was watching my uncle play the first mission, which at the time I remember thinking, oh, that's pretty cool. And then having my eight-year-old minds collectively blown when he showed me the All Gilly Up mission. After the game released on November 5th of 2007, word spread like wildfire on just how incredible the game was. This game not only modernized the franchise, not only did it win several Game of the Year accolades, but it more or less revolutionized the entire genre. But the big question is, how did it even get to that point in the first place? How and why is this considered such a revolutionary game, not just for the genre, but for gaming as a whole? And I guess the bigger question in context of this video, is it still worth going back to? Is it still worth playing, you know, single player, multiplayer, all that? I mean, the short answer is yes, but <laughs> let's just get into it. So for the first time in the series, we have one central campaign. This time, Infinity Ward is not focused on fronts. Instead, we have one cohesive narrative where you play as two characters, both of which's stories play off of and directly tie into one another. In addition, we also have multiplayer, and there's a lot to digest there as well. So let's get straight into it and start with the story. What exactly happens in Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare? Also, I should mention, spoiler warning for the campaign and, well, every Call of Duty game I talk about from this point on. There's obviously a lot more going on now, so I'm spoiling every single one of these stories front to back. Talking not just the story and the levels, but the narrative and the characters too. So yeah, let's talk about Call of Duty 4. The year is the near future of 2011. <laughs> yeah, it is. The Middle East and European world are thrown into a bit of a frenzy. Russia has broken out into a second civil war between its democratic Russian Federation and the Ultranationalist Party, a group that wants the country to return to the days of the Soviet Union. And in the Middle East... somewhere? The game never exactly tells what country this takes place in. I think it's implied to be somewhere off of the Persian Gulf based on some of the in-game news broadcasts. Maybe they were too afraid of straight up calling it a country in the Middle East given when it came out. I don't know. But either way, the government here is overthrown by Khalid al-Assad who vehemently hates the West and wishes to return the country to what it was before the West influenced its politics. In response, the United States straight up just invades the country and begins an attempt to hunt down and kill al-Assad. 
At the same time this is happening, the British SAS recruits a new member by the name of Sergeant John McTavish, also known by Soap. He is now on Captain Price's team, in a brand new version of the character from the first two games. And frankly, a better version at that. Price wasn't terrible in the last two games, but he doesn't even come close to this Price. This Captain Price is awesome, and he only gets better as the series goes on. He's a lot more cold-hearted than the last version of Price, and when push comes to shove, he gets shit done, and he gets it done well. Special shout has gotta go to Billy Murray's performance of him. He knocks it out of the park here, and is probably the best voice actor here. And right off the bat, this is already the first major compliment I can give to Call of Duty 4. It gives me characters I actually care about. Some of them are for sure stronger than others, but Call of Duty 4 does a pretty good job at giving these characters personality, even if it does come off as a bit one-dimensional at times. Gaz has some pretty funny one-liners here and there, and Griggs doesn't really take himself seriously at all. It's not perfect by any means, again, these characters aren't super in-depth, but I appreciate that right off the bat, Call of Duty 4 tries to give its characters charms or quirks the last games didn't really have. Anyways, Price's team infiltrates a cargo ship in the Bering Strait and discovers a nuke on the ship in Arabic, but before they can do anything, a couple of MiGs destroy the ship and the team barely escapes it before it can sink. Following this, Price's team heads to Russia to rescue Nikolai, a spy within the ultranationalist party that supply the intel for the boats, with the assistance of Russian loyalists led by Sergeant Kamarov. After giving him a few bonks on the head from Gaz, Price and the others rescue Nikolai and extract, as he warns them the Americans are making a mistake for invading the Middle East and trying to take al-Assad. During the extraction, their helicopter is shot down, forcing them to trudge through the Russian countryside to find a new escape route, and with the help of an AC-130 gunship, they manage to escape. Meanwhile, in the Middle East, you play as Sergeant Paul Jackson under the command of Lieutenant Vasquez, moving from place to place to find Al-Assad. It starts off kind of... I, I don't even say kind of. It starts off really on the nose, too. You have the United States running into the country in probably the only way they would ever know how to. The war continues for a few days as they help out and gain support from a tank crew, and launch a full frontal assault on the country's presidential palace. And they really pull out all the stops here to try and kill al-Assad. Guess that's what the fucker gets for not wanting to succumb to democracy, baby. However, things start to escalate a little bit towards the end, as a Nest team discovers there's a nuclear threat in the city, and order US troops to pull out while they can assess the threat. But before your squad does, al-Assad's forces take down a Cobra, and in a very quick last-ditch effort, your team goes down to go and save the pilot. Get the pilot. No one gets left behind. You fucking said it, Vasquez. No American soldier is getting left behind to face terrorists. Fuck these guys. They really dare tread on this with their anti-democracy ways. It's like fucking hell. Let's get this pilot out of here, pull back, and take down all the sought after your group, bitches. That's how America does it. I repeat. The Americans lose? That's not how this is supposed to happen. We're the, we're the American military. No, 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 no. We're fucking unstoppable, right? You can't just, you can't just kill off the main character like that. This is the part where I like pretend to play the game and then just drop my controller in shock, like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's easy not to think about this too much nowadays given the later controversies Call of Duty would find itself in, but yeah, this was pretty shocking at the time it came out. To not only see the Americans get such a crushing defeat and buy a nuke going off, no less, was pretty unexpected given the status quo of Call of Duty and frankly a lot of other FPS games at the time were following. And they really hammer this in too. Right after this, there's a brief mission where you play as Jackson in his last moments after the explosion and slowly dying from radiation. It's incredibly bleak stuff. Now, whether or not Infinity War was trying to actually say something with this scene and with the game as a whole for that matter, it's... Honestly, kind of hard to tell, especially when you consider the games that come out after this one. Modern Warfare definitely has a more grounded, grittier story to tell all around, but it doesn't really seem to go further beyond that. Especially as, right after this, the story has you play as Soap for the rest of the game, and your very first task is to find Al-Assad hiding in his safe house in Azerbaijan. And it still has me wondering to this day, because on one hand, I really feel like they were trying to say something with this part of the campaign. Does America really have any business interfering with foreign affairs like this? Was this actually connected to the war in the Middle East happening at the time? Is this the kind of response we shouldn't be surprised about if we decide to ever interfere with foreign affairs like this? I mean, America is the one that invades the country in the first place. Yeah, the country and Russia's ultra-nationalist party are threats, but how threatening would they have been had America not interfered like they did? And what does the game say about this? I don't know! And this is kind of my only major problem with Modern Warfare's story, because it wants to tell a more grounded story, but it doesn't really seem to go anywhere with it. Because on the other hand, I remember on occasion that the trilogy starts like this, and then by the third game, 
you blow the fucking Eiffel Tower up. Call of Duty 4 really seems unsure if it wants to push things the extra mile when it comes to its commentary on war, foreign affairs, nuclear threats, you name it. They present it, but it doesn't really seem like it has anything actually meaningful to say, besides just presenting it. And considering the direction Modern Warfare 2 and 3 go after this, maybe that was the intention, because I can't figure out if the story's trying to make a statement in any way, especially, like I said, when in the very next mission, Price's team finds Al-Assad, interrogates him on how he got the nuke and why he set it off, and they get revenge for the United States by killing him. Anyways, to get back to the story there, during this interrogation, Al-Assad's phone rings and Price answers. Price realizes that the man on the other end of the line is Imran Zakayev. He explains that in 1996, Zakayev began forming the ultranationalist party by profiting from nuclear proliferation in the wake of Chernobyl and the Soviet Union's collapse. Because of this growing threat, the United Kingdom authorized an assassination of him by Price and his Captain Macmillan in Pripyat during an arms deal. Price takes the shot and blows off his arm, presumably killing Zakayev, with him and Macmillan barely escaping. But as it turns out, Zakayev survived the attempt and was the one who supplied Al-Assad with nuclear materials in the first place. After holding off ultranationalist forces and managing to escape Azerbaijan, Price and his team join up with the Marines to capture Zakayev's son, Victor, in order to figure out where Imran is hiding. The ambush doesn't go as planned, and Victor game ends himself in order to prevent being captured. In retaliation, Zakayev quite literally goes to the nuclear option and seizes control of a nuclear launch facility in Russia. The SAS and USMC join up again to take the site back, but before they can, Zakayev just straight up launches two nukes towards the United States. With the stakes high, Price and his team storm their way into the facility, just managing to get the abort codes from the Russians in time and destroy the nukes before they can hit the East Coast. They then attempt to flee the remaining ultranationalists, but get cornered after a helicopter takes out the bridge. During the fight, most of the soldiers are killed, including Griggs, with Gaz being killed by Zakayev himself. Just as they're about to finish the job on Soap, Kamarov arrives with his Russian loyalists in a counterattack, and in the ensuing chaos, Price pushes a pistol to Soap, who uses it to kill Zakayev once and for all. The day is saved, and the nukes are stopped. Price's fate is left unknown as Kamarov comes down to rescue Soap. A news broadcast then explains the nuke incident and the ultranationalist connection to Al-Assad are covered up ending Call of Duty 4. Except for this quick mission where you board a plane, save the VIP, and jump off of it as it explodes within three minutes, then ending Call of Duty 4 and proving it's probably more British SCS propaganda than American military propaganda. Overall, I mean, I guess in terms of the story itself, it's fine enough. Again, my main issue with it pretty much stems from the lack of nuance it has. Call of Duty 4 really hones in on telling a more realistic story, but it really only really stops there. I'm probably looking too deep into it, this is Call of Duty after all, but again, I think you have to, have to consider the context of when this game came out. You have the Americans lose to a Middle Eastern country after they blow up a nuke in a game that came out in the middle of the war on terrorism. You would expect that to ruffle some feathers, and believe me, it kinda did at the time, but again, Call of Duty 4 doesn't really go anywhere with this. Again, am I looking way too deep into it? Probably, it's possible, but ultimately, above all else, it just seems like it's more concerned with telling a story set in modern day, likely to allow for more creative set pieces and spectacle than Infinity War could accomplish in the first two games. And when that spectacle happens, it is really cool. I just personally wish that if the story was going to take this approach to give it some more nuance. This also doesn't consider some of the other issues the story has. The villains are kind of bland in this game. Al-Assad makes a strong first impression when you play the mission where he kills the president, and especially so after the nuke goes off. But aside from him hating the West, we never really get any motivations for why he's doing this. I don't think he even has any dialogue outside of his opening monologue, and he's just kind of anticlimactically killed off by Price. Again, realistic, but doesn't really have any nuance. Zakayev is just also sort of... there. Outside of the mission in Azerbaijan, where we hear the ultranationalists killing civilians, we don't really get any other motivations here besides... The ultranationalists want to restore the Soviet Union, and more so, we don't really see their efforts, at least not enough in context to the narrative. There's no mission like the one with the president where we see how this party has been affecting Russia. We're just told that there's a second civil war going on, and kind of have to take it at face value. We don't even really know who Zakayev is until Price goes into his backstory halfway into the game. Because of that, he doesn't really have any intimidating presence here. Yeah, that changes towards the end when he launches two nukes. That would make anybody intimidating. But before that, the ultra-nationalists kind of just serve as the bad guys of the game. Like I said, it's clear the intent was less on the central narrative and more an excuse to give us a military campaign set in modern day. That being said, to that degree, it does that exceptionally well. My enjoyment from this campaign comes from two things. For one, the characters, which I already talked a little bit about, but I have to emphasize again, having characters I actually care about 
makes a huge difference from the last several games. This game sets a foundation for some really great characters, and even though it's only a foundation, it's just enough that I can get enjoyment out of it. The second is the levels themselves and the level design. God, the gameplay of Call of Duty 4 is fan fucking tastic. The game largely follows the same design philosophy as Call of Duty 2. While each mission is mostly linear, the game will still consistently funnel you towards the action, and on occasion will sometimes be just open and ended enough to allow you to tackle sub objectives in a sort of non-linear fashion. Nothing too crazy or extraordinary, but there's noticeably more wiggle room than Call of Duty 2 had, and especially more than Call of Duty 3, in terms of paths you can take during a level. It probably helps that a lot of these sections are designed like the maps from the actual multiplayer, but we'll talk about that when we get to it. Right off the bat, objectives and levels this time are so much more varied compared to the last games. No more destroying AA guns, killing machine gun turrets, or waiting for reinforcements. This is where the modern in Modern Warfare truly shines, because with the new modern setting, there are a ton of new objectives and methods of progressing compared to the limited pool of World War II. For example, the mission Shock and Awe will have you jumping from point to point in a helicopter with a grenade launcher in addition to traditional gunfights. Death from Above is an entire mission where you control a gunship from the sky and take out enemies with thermal sights. Some of the traditional stuff from past games is there, like the Breach and Cleary and Charlie Don't Surf, or the car chase sequence and the final mission game over, but thanks to the more modern setting, there's a lot of new stuff to play around with as well, and after playing three World War II games back to back, this feels incredibly refreshing, even all these years later. Something else these levels do incredibly well is gradually increasing stakes as a level progresses. All Gillied Up is probably the perfect example of this. I could go into a whole separate video on why this mission is so incredible and why it's considered one of the best levels in any video game, but a large part of that is how the tension increases across a mission where you have to absolutely be stealth the entire time. The mission will start with you taking out a couple patrols before escalating with you trying to crawl your way around enemy units and tanks with nothing but a sniper rifle. You'll continue on taking out and sneaking past larger numbers of patrols, have to rush your way past an entire convoy as effectively as possible, before letting some of that tension loose towards the end with a couple more patrols and a wild dog. And even then, the tension never leaves because besides being behind enemy lines, you're in fucking Chernobyl, where one wrong turn could mean life or death from absorbing too much radiation. Another fantastic example is the mission Heat. On paper, this is 100% just a complete backtracking mission of Safe House and should not have worked. But it's the way they present this mission that makes it work so incredibly well. You start off at the bottom of the hill using planted explosives to fend off some of the ultra-nationalists. The first time you pull back, you have to spool up a minigun from a downed chopper to fend off incoming forces before pulling back again, and this time manually setting off explosives yourself. Finally, towards the end as you start holding off at the farmhouse and use a javelin to destroy some tanks, you're told by your superiors that the LZ is too hot, and you'll have to make your way all the way back down. And at first, the only person that seems more pissed about this than the player is Gaz. Almost like the game knew you'd be a little bit peeved. But by this point, you can call in airstrikes to help fend off more incoming ultranationalists. So you're not entirely fighting your way back down the same way. And topping all of this off is that the mission's structure is completely different from Safe House, which had you breach and clear a handful of houses on your way to the farm with the help of a chopper gunner. Choices like this help make Modern Warfare not feel that repetitive, because the execution of these levels is so varied across the entire campaign. Combined with that same design philosophy as Call of Duty 2, where you're always being pulled towards the action, whether or not you're being stealthy or going in guns blazing, Call of Duty 4 is just a really fun game to play. It's not really the story that brings me back to this game so often as much as it is the gameplay and the levels themselves, and because of that, I can say with absolute confidence this single player still holds up incredibly well. This is topped off with great art direction, sound design, and music, especially the music. It has this intense melancholy to it that most other soundtracks in the series don't have. It isn't as awe-inspiring as the World War II games, but it isn't as bombastic and in-your-face as later games would have. It's another reason All Gillied Up is such a good level. The moment those drums kick in when you're navigating that convoy, God, so good. But you know, single player obviously is not the only thing we have to talk about with this game. Surprisingly, there are still a lot of people, I mean, a lot of people still playing the multiplayer on this game to this day. I don't know if I would fully recommend it, not for the reasons you are probably thinking, which I'll get into why later, but it was nice and refreshing that, you know, I could actually talk about this game's multiplayer, talk about, you know, why it's so revolutionary, why it was such a big deal. 
and even uh, talk about some of his shortcomings, I'm going to be honest here. So before this game, in Call of Duty, and a lot of multiplayer FPS games for that matter, you usually didn't have a lot of variety when it came to selection. If a game wasn't designed like Halo where you would always spawn in with the same weapons and found new ones at power positions on maps, you usually spawned in with a predetermined setup. Even in games like Counter-Strike where you could buy your weapons, you were still kind of limited as to what you could actually do and accomplish. In Call of Duty, for example, you could spawn in with a setup that lets you use an MP40 or a setup that lets you use a Car 98. Each setup was designed for certain play styles in mind and the larger multiplayer game itself. Call of Duty 4, that all gets thrown out the window. While you start off low leveled and have to use predetermined setups, very early on, you'll unlock one of the first big innovations of this game. This is the create a class system. This time, you don't spawn in with predetermined weapons or setups. Instead, Call of Duty 4 encourages you to set up your own. You start by selecting a primary weapon that can range from assault rifles, submachine guns, light machine guns, shotguns, and sniper rifles. You also have a few options for sidearms to have, everyone spawns in with grenades, and you can pick a special grenade which can be a flashbane, a stun grenade, or a smoke grenade. Each of these weapons can also get attachments, which you unlock by completing challenges for said weapon. Most of these can be as simple as getting kills, or specific kinds of kills such as headshots. Attachments can range from a silencer to keep you off the radar, scopes to enhance your accuracy, underbarrel grenade launchers, and so on. I was also surprised to see this was actually the first game where you can unlock camos for guns as well. There's nothing flashy like much later games have, but you still gotta put the work in to actually earn them, which is pretty cool. In addition, you can select three different perks for each class as well. Perk 1 usually gives you extra equipment, like extra magazines for your gun, an RPG, C4, claymores, or you can use this slot to detect explosives and equipment altogether. Perks 2 and 3 give you more passive and aggressive benefits. Perk 2 can give you double tap, which increases your rate of fire, stopping power, which increases bullet damage, or overkill, which lets you carry two primary weapons instead of one with a pistol. Perk 3 options can range from dead silence, which silences your footsteps, martyrdom, which drops a grenade when you're killed, and last stand, which lets you pull out a pistol before dying in a last ditch effort to get someone. Okay, on that note too, I should mention real quick, this game does have local split screen. Don't even bother with it on this game unless you're both playing online. Local co-op on this game is extremely limiting. You don't have every game mode available. You don't have create a class. Hell, not even every map is available to play locally for some dumb reason. So here's the deal. This design is one of the best things about Call of Duty 4 and Call of Duty as a whole. For the first time, you're not constrained to one singular play style. You can customize how you want to play. If you want to run a submachine gun class but have a pocket RPG, you can do that. You need extra magazines for a gun that burns through ammo quickly, there's a perk that helps with that. Every time you fire an unsuppressed gun in the game, you'll show up as an enemy dot on the game's radar, but there's also a perk that keeps you off the radar as well as suppressors, which come in handy when UAVs are called in. More on that later. With all this in mind, nothing's stopping you from mixing and matching certain playstyles and stacking benefits to help with that playstyle. It allows for a lot more freedom when it comes to the core gameplay loop, and in that sense, I think Call of Duty 4 succeeds very, very well. But obviously, with a new system like this, there's bound to be balance issues. Some of it has to do with the perks. Juggernaut can make gunfights pretty inconsistent. What could take only a few bullets to kill a normal player, now takes a few more. Double tap and stopping power straight up made certain guns objectively better, so it becomes less about who is the better player and more about who has the better perks. This also goes for some of the weapons themselves. The M16 is infamously busted in this game. A three round burst weapon that can kill in two bullets. Great. Combine this with a grenade launcher and you're almost unstoppable. Quick note too, maybe it's just me, but it feels like the grenade indicator got neutered in this game. It feels like as soon as it comes up, you're basically dead. It doesn't really fade in and out as much, which can get pretty frustrating. The balancing here isn't as bad as some later games, and I'll admit, some of these balancing issues are hard to see at surface glance when I haven't experienced this game's multiplayer as much as those other games. But having perks that make you objectively better than other players, rather than giving you some sort of passive benefit, is just not a good way of balancing a game. I hate coming across players with Last Stand. You wanna know why people hated this coming back in the new Modern Warfare 2? Look no further than this game. This perk is a complete pace breaker in the heat of the moment because not only do you not fully kill someone who has this perk and have to waste more time to put them down for good, but they have a chance to win the gunfight if you don't pay attention. I can get behind perks that make you a more active player, but some of these perks that objectively make you stronger just should not be here, and I'm glad this was a lesson the devs learned after this game. But all that said, you know what? I'm just gonna be honest. That unbalance is kind of part of the charm of the gameplay loop here. Call of Duty 4's multiplayer, just like the campaign, constantly keeps things moving. You don't get any dull moments, and it actively encourages you to stay alive and keep your pace going. 
New to the series are kill streaks, which you can get after getting a certain number of kills in one life. At three kills, you get a UAV, which sweeps your radar to paint enemy locations. At five kills, you can call in a precision airstrike on a location to bomb the area. And at seven kills, you can call in an automated attack helicopter to patrol the map for a limited amount of time. And even though these aren't super strong, especially considering how involved this system gets in later games, it is still beyond satisfying to not only get these kill streaks, but to have any kind of streak going on in the first place. It's one of the best things about this game and Call of Duty as a whole from this point onward. It makes playing the game consistently rewarding. When I first got on to record multiplayer footage, I sucked ass. Like, I was doing embarrassingly bad and got humbled pretty quickly. But the longer I played, the more comfortable I felt playing it again, and I could slowly start to see myself improving on a game-to-game -game basis. Something modern Call of Duty has straight up just lost altogether, but we'll cross that bridge when we get there. It certainly helps that the maps here, for the most part, are pretty decent. Most of the maps here follow a three-lane structure, and depending on the map, certain guns will perform better on certain maps or certain areas of a map. For example, while a map like Strike allows for a decent amount of close quarter fights where some machine guns can rule, there's also maps like Pipeline where snipers can do really well. And yeah, this was one of the first games to give birth to the quick scoping play style, where you quickly scope into a rifle, shoot an enemy, and back out. And man, even years later, this feels so, so, so satisfying to pull off. You can use them as regular sniper rifles, sure, but nothing beats how fucking powerful you feel after pulling one off successfully. Not every map is made equally, some of them can be a bit of a drag to play sometimes, and other maps are just objectively better than others. There's a reason a lot of people back out of games or vote to skip when block comes up, because it's the worst map in the game. Lawn sights, narrow corridors, and a map center that is too open and doesn't allow for any maneuverability. Overgrown is another one I tend to skip, which just feels too big and open. However, when a map here is good, it's really fucking good. Crash and Vacant allow for a wide variety of play styles, and it feels like every single one of them can be rewarded. Ambush and Crossfire really reward aggressive play. I think one of my favorites ended up actually being Chinatown, one of the DLC maps you can get for this game for free on the original version of the game. I was pleasantly surprised by how much I enjoyed it and how good the overall flow was to gunfights and map movement. I honestly like to see this map come back again. It's kind of an underrated gem. Something else new to the series, as weird as it sounds, is leveling up. As you play the game and progress, you'll rank up, with the highest level being 55. Each rank will unlock new weapons, perks, customization options, challenges, the works. However, once you hit max level, you'll probably notice this little thing called prestige mode. Once you reach max rank, you can enter this mode which gets you a special emblem to equip, but in return, you'll have to grind through all 55 levels again in order to get the next prestige rank. At the risk of seriously pissing off like 90% of the Call of Duty fanbase, I think this mechanic is completely dog shit. Look, I don't know how it is in later games, and frankly I was never good enough growing up in these games to even come close to that point anyways, and the modern games are doing something entirely different when it comes to grinding... <clears throat> prestige. I'm sorry, I hate the idea of completely resetting your progress and going through all of it again, just for something as simple as an emblem. Yeah, it's cool to show off and show us how much time and effort you've put into the game, but having to unlock the same exact shit 10 times in a row just for bragging rights doesn't sound like fun to me. It sounds like a totally tedious grind. And in Modern Warfare's case, it basically is. The series later on shows that there are much better ways of showing off how much you grind in this game with rewards that actually feel fulfilling. Again, maybe it's better in future games I'll cover. I do know some of the games give you an extra class slot if you prestige, which is a nice reward, but why would I want to spend all that time leveling up just to unlock the same stuff over and over again at least 10 fucking times? Chances are, if I'm shit at the game now, getting max prestige isn't going to change much besides that I'm shit at the game, but at least I have a cool emblem. And chances are, if I'm actually good at the game, want to keep playing it, and even want to play competitively and keep up with playing competitively, arbitrarily restarting my progress is the last thing I want to do. I never understood why this was so popular with players. I hear all the time that this progression needs to come back after the games from Modern Warfare 2019 and onwards scrapped it. And while I have my own separate issues with grinding and progression on those games, unlocking the same exact things over and over again doesn't sound like a suitable replacement to me. I guess the last thing to talk about are game modes, which unfortunately I couldn't play around with too much on this game. So the tough thing with recommending these older games is that because they're so old and because Call of Duty is so yearly annualized, there's really only a small portion of players playing these older games. At least on console anyways, I reviewed the Xbox 360 version of this game for this video. Because of that, you're usually most likely to find people playing Team Deathmatch, Free For All, Domination, or Search and Destroy. Any other game modes, especially ones unique to the game and or era when it came out, you'll be pretty lucky to find any kind of matches. That or hardcore mode. 
which debuts in this game. This is essentially the hard mode of multiplayer. You have a limited HUD, much less health that doesn't regenerate, and friendly fire is enabled. Unfortunately, again, I couldn't really play this too much since not many people are playing this game, if at all, on console, either because of the game's age or because of the risks associated with it. Now, I don't want to fearmonger and say not to play these games at all, but you do have to keep in mind that since they're older and not well maintained, don't be surprised if you run into someone cheating every once in a while, or come across a modded lobby that could be malicious in some way. You don't have to worry about it too often. Call of Duty 4 is kind of one of the lesser offensive ones when it comes to this. And usually getting around this is about as easy as just quitting a game and requeuing. But I recommend if you're going to play the multiplayer, play it on PC specifically, and maybe even download a client or server that'll make it safe to play. Especially since the original PC version has server browsing, and it has really great mod support that people still play a lot of to this day. The PC community for Call of Duty 4 has made some really great stuff. Custom levels, custom maps, dedicated servers, you name it. Call of Duty 4 overall is a great game. The single player alone makes it worth it with its fantastic level design, great characters and set pieces, and amount of variety. The multiplayer, while unbalanced, is still incredibly fresh and addicting, and I found myself a lot while making this review, forgetting that I was reviewing a game, and just wanted to keep playing multiplayer. It really is that much fun despite its setbacks and balance and the few bad maps it has. You can get the original game on Steam for 20 bucks, which given how a lot of the games are still being sold at full price digitally, this is honestly a pretty good price for the package you're getting here. I think this is also a good way to segue into Modern Warfare Remastered, especially if multiplayer is something that interests you on console specifically. This was released in 2016 by Raven Software, initially as a pre-order bonus for Infinite Warfare. Yeah, that generated its own kind of backlash back then, but it would see a standalone release the following summer. If you want to play Call of Duty 4 on console specifically nowadays, this game is the best way to do it. The game obviously got a facelift across the board. It looks and plays much better than the original game. There's some nice touch-ups like new animations and even some cut content and objectives. And there's more to unlock with Intel in the campaign. This was in the original game too, but to my knowledge, it was really only a collectible that got you an achievement. In Remastered, getting Intel unlocks some pretty cool cheats and modifiers for the game, giving you extra incentive to play it. Multiplayer is mostly kept intact for better and... sometimes for worse, again, Juggernaut and Sovereign Power, but it still has that same fun gameplay loop. People are still playing this version too on consoles, and since it's more recent, it's a little more secure. Some modes from the original are gone, but they're replaced with honestly, much better game modes all around. Hardpoint comes to this game for the first time, and Prop Hunt is always going to be a fun time no matter what game it is. The only real downside to it besides, well, the multiplayer still keeping its unbalances is the fucking microtransactions. Okay, first of all, what was once a map pack that was only like seven bucks turned to a free map pack in the original game is now 15 bucks for remastered. Thanks, Activision. Second, this game came out when loot boxes were still a thing, and Call of Duty was one of the worst offenders of it. For the most part, I wouldn't complain too much about it. The vast majority of it is purely cosmetic stuff like operator skins, melee weapons to replace your knife, weapon camos, and on the subject of camos, this game does have a proper camo grind with proper mastery challenges, so there is something you can grind to show off that isn't prestige, well, at least to the game's credit, at least here, prestige unlocks an extra class for you, and you can unlock uh, a lot of these. But then you'll notice the second problem. In the weapon selection are brand new weapons too. Guess what? The only way to unlock these is by getting specific items from these loot boxes. These are all randomized items, and sometimes you can get duplicates. You unlock credits as you play in order to get these boxes, or you can spend real life money instead. And very quickly, you can start to see the problem here. I mean, at least on the surface level, it seems like the weapons aren't necessary to have. You can still get by with an overpowered M16 just fine, but yeah. Activision didn't have any shame back then, and they still don't, but you know what I mean. You want these guns, you either have to really grind for them, hope you get lucky with the boxes, or burn actual money and pray for the best. Look, I'll be the first to shamefully admit I've spent a decent amount of money on bundles from the current games, probably more than I should, but at least with these I not only know exactly what I'm getting, they don't affect gameplay anymore. Or at least for a while I didn't, still bitter about that fucking pay to win black cell I ended up buying. Oh my god, I gotta stop buying this shit. The point I'm trying to make is that is this shit shouldn't affect the actual gameplay. If I'm wasting money, I want to know exactly what I'm wasting it on. And unfortunately, this game came out when loot boxes were still the craze every big company was jumping to for quick money. I don't think I need to tell you not to waste your money on this. Let alone spend close to full price to own both this game as well as the DLC for it. Wait for a sale or buy it secondhand. Again, I know that's rich coming from someone who has bought so much cosmetic stuff for the current games, but I don't know, do as I say, not as I do. In the end, I mean, 
what else can I really say? This game is held in such high regard for really good reason. It put Call of Duty on the map as more than just another shooter. It turned into a sensation that everybody was playing. So much of this game's DNA can be seen in so many other shooters to this day. From its creative class system, its perks, its kill streaks, its overall arcade style, this game became a blueprint. Not just for future Call of Duty games, but for military shooters as a whole. Everybody wanted to do what Call of Duty 4 was doing. Some of them successful, some of them not so much. I mean, even Halo at one point gave these mechanics a shot. When competition that big is copying what you're doing, you know you did something right. I do have my own gripes and issues with it, but all in all, Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare is a title I still really enjoy going back to, even to this day, and one I can still strongly recommend checking out. Whether it be for that classic arcade multiplayer or the fantastic levels in single player. But you know, as we all know at this point, Call of Duty was basically just getting started here. Call of Duty 4 was a massive success, and Activision would naturally greenlight a sequel that Infinity War was all too eager to make. But you know, Treyarch was cooking up something pretty interesting of their own, one real final last curtain call for the series World War II Roots before finally moving on and putting it to an end. At least for the time being.